Hello, friends, and welcome to our SBT Sunday teachings. I'm thrilled to have you here. My name is Venerable Tarpa. Before we begin, let's take a moment to appreciate our handsome community gathered here today. We have a lovely group of people here today. Really nice turnout for a, a summer Sunday where most people have a lot of obligations. Um, Today, I feel fortunate to sit as a member of this lovely community in the safety and security of like-minded friends, sharing this present moment with others dedicated to the cultivation of goodness. Today, I'm grateful for the direction and support that this community provides, a community worthy of my time and commitment, a community where my efforts have meaning, purpose, and are appreciated. Today I'm thankful for this community of awakening, a place to gain the knowledge and skills to improve my life, a family, a home, and a sanctuary for all of us seeking refuge from the storm. And let's remember as conscientious practitioners, we must recognize our responsibility to the world, to strive to live skillfully while helping others to do the same, to strive to live in balance and harmony with nature and others, to strive to, to gain mastery over our minds and embody our true benevolent nature, to expand our hearts and minds, transcending our shared human limitations, to not intentionally harm sentient life or our planet, and to maturely accept and embrace the reality of our situation while striving to improve it. So again, welcome to Sunday's this Sunday teaching. It's a very exciting teaching. For this month, we've been uh, engaged in a short teaching series on understanding self, uh, who we are according to Buddhism. And today is uh, week four, and we're going to summarize and try to make sense of all the different things we learned. So on week one, we kind of did an intro on self according to Buddhism. And we talked about some of the more complicated uh, terminology and misunderstood terminology, as well as uh, talking about the philosoph uh, philosophical viewpoint that we were, uh, we were uh, sharing this teaching from. Week two, we got into the doctrine of the two truths and something we call the collective conceptual construct. Week three, last week, we talked about dependent origination and emptiness. And today, again, we're going to summarize what we uh, talked about so far and how to engage with the Buddhist view of self and what it means to our lives, how we can use it to our benefit. So, Buddhism asserts that how we understand ourselves, our environment, our lives, reality itself, is what leads us to awakening itself. So we often talk about, if we're defining awakening, we'll often say that awakening is, uh, is awakening to the true understanding of ourselves and, and reality. We can also understand awakening as awakening to our true value, our true potential, and our true nature. That's a, a, a line that we like to use with SBT. Uh, and meaning, awakening to our true value of, of really appreciating these extraordinary beings that we are and all that we're capable of. Something none of us really do. I, we'll go through our whole lives and we'll never really appreciate what it is to be a human being in this world. It is, it is extraordinary. Understanding our true potential comes from understanding our true value. And an, another thing that we'll go through our whole lives and we'll never achieve, no one ever achieves their full value, a true potential. Whether it's Mozart or Einstein, uh, there's always more that any, any one of us can do. Then we talk about our true nature, under, awakening to our true nature. That's what we're really focusing on in this series. 
and um, understanding what we are, who we are, our relationship with our environment, our relationships with others, understanding our life and understanding real, reality itself. And so the idea is by understanding ourselves, our reality, we can then engage skillfully with our world and therefore get the results that we want from our lives. So when we understand who and what we are, our environment, life itself, we, we have a much better potential at gaining the things we want in our lifetime, which is happiness. Buddhism asserts that all the things we want in life, we're, what, we're really, what we're really wanting and striving for is happiness. <clears throat> so you could say, well, I don't know about that. I, I want to be rich or somebody else wants to be famous or somebody else wants, wants to be a great musician or a great politician. But when you ask the question, well, why do you want those things? It, the answer always comes back to happiness. Well, I want to be rich. Why? Oh, because I'll be happy. I want to be famous because I believe I'll be happy. So, uh, so it is true in Buddhism. We assert that that all things are leading to this idea of gaining happiness, satisfaction, contentment. Um, in in our second class, we talked about the two truths, and we talked about the two truths being two different ways that we can perceive and understand the world. So the two truths don't assert that the world exists in two ways. It asserts that we perceive the world in two distinct ways and therefore apprehend and understand the world in two separate ways. Uh, I won't get into it. We, we talked about that in the second teaching. But the way this leads to awakening is, again, that same idea that by really understanding who we are and basically understanding how life works, we have a much better potential at gaining the happiness that we seek. So this is why Buddhism is so focused on this and focusing on, on understanding life and probably even more importantly, understanding our own minds and gaining mastery over our minds. In Buddhism, gaining mastery over, over your mind is to gain mastery over your life, which is to gain mastery over your happiness and suffering. We also talked about the conceptual construct, uh, and we, we talked about that with the two truths, we have conventional truth, which is a conventional perception of the world. Walking out the door, we look around, we see cars, we see trees, we see people walking down the street, and it's a perfectly valid way of apprehending the world. And it is true from that perspective. Those are trees, those are, those are cars, those are people walking down the street. But the two truths asserts that there's another way to perceive the world. And that's through analysis and investigation. We can investigate and see a deeper workings of the world. And through understanding the deeper workings of the world, again, we can be more skillful in living our lives, right? We can live investigated lives that are happier. Um, and the two truths tell us that we uh, conventionally we see the world as one myriad of, of things we see uh, we see a surface level of all objects but when we when we use some analysis and we look deeper we realize that the world actually doesn't exist in that simple way that we perceive it when we analyze it we see that it's much more comp the world is much more complex than we initially see it and um, and we and and things like dependent origination and the topic of emptiness are apprehended and we start to notice that that all of these things that we see as distinct unique objects that exist onto themselves 
is false. And the fact is, is that all things exist in relation to, to each other, that nothing comes into existence on its own independently. And instead, all things come into existence in dependence upon causes, conditions, parts, and pieces, that the all of reality is collections of collections of collections of collections. All these things are interdependent. <clears throat> now, emptiness comes in and takes it another step further. Remember that dependent origination and emptiness are two sides of the same coin. They're both asserting the same thing, but from opposite perspectives. So dependent origination says that all things exist in, in dependence upon each other. Emptiness says the same thing, but in the opposite, that nothing exists interdependent, uh, independently. So, but emptiness also brings in this idea that let alone are phenomena dependent on other phenomena, but phenomena actually lacks any and all essential essence that makes it uniquely itself. So we did the example, we dissected a book and we took apart all the pieces and parts and we talked about it and we realized that there was no single essential essence that was the book. And now that, that was important when we're talking about the book, but even more so when we're talking about ourselves and the Buddhist idea of self, which is what we're talking about today. And we talked about when we dissect a, hu a human being and we look at all the pieces, parts, body, mind, uh, and even conceptual things like memory, experience, feelings. When we dissect a human being and, and we, lo we look through all these parts and pieces, we realize there is no one essence that is distinctly us. And this is the Buddha's teachings on anatta, or anatman in Sanskrit, meaning anatta means that there's no permanent, unchanging, essential essence that makes up who we are. Right? Sometimes atta is translated as soul. There's no soul. So this is a different concept in the world of religions. I believe Buddhism is the only religion that asserts no soul. And um, so, so Buddhism asserts that, that there's no soul, there's no permanent, unchanging, essential essence within us that makes us who we are. Instead, all of our pieces, parts, causes, and conditions are interdependent. <clears throat> However, we do possess a self. We possess an identity. But that identity isn't permanent. It's not an unchanging essential essence that makes us who we are. In Buddhism, self is a concept that encapsulates all that we are. It encapsulates it all into one idea, me, I, right? This narrative self is built upon all of our, our thoughts, our views, our intentions, attitudes, emotions, memories, experiences, our relationships, as well as our physical aspects, right? All of these, these things that are, un are separate parts of us, conceptually, it's all brought together with an idea the idea that all of these things are me. <clears throat> now, uh, so Buddhism has a unique take on this, and we have an affirmation that we share uh, in our group that is, I wanted to share here with everybody. Oh my goodness, let me see if I can find it. They keep moving the buttons around on me. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so I wrote this affirmation a while back. And this was an attempt to kind of clarify 
a lot of the things that we we've been talking about for the last three weeks and uh, so it, it's called the affirmation of my true nature what i want to do is i want to read through it and then we'll go through it slowly and just uh, and talk about any of the parts and you guys can ask questions if you'd like to affirmation of my true nature i exist as a conceptual identity an idea imputed upon collections labeled the mind, collections labeled body, and collections labeled experiences. I am an ethereal and wondrous entity, blessed with infinite potential and an unlimited capacity for good. These collections and identity are not static elements, but instead are dynamic processes, existing interdependently in a state of constant and infinite change. My reality is a subjective interpretation of an objective world, perceived through limited sense perceptions and understood by way of a collective conceptual construct, which serves as a beneficial interface with my environment. My liberation is contingent on my ever deepening understanding of this truth. Therefore, my practice is a daily cultivation and embodiment of this truth, leading to its direct experiential realization, which is awakening. I'll make this slide available to everybody after the teaching. Um, so this, you probably recognize quite a few of the thoughts in this. We've been talking about it for the last three weeks. So let's go through a little slower. So I exist as a conceptual identity and idea. And here we're talking about the narrative self. And this is something that's uh, a current, a very popular uh, idea in uh, current philosophy, the idea of narrative self. And this is what Buddhism uh, posits as a self. So, uh, but it's a conceptual identity, right? It, it's based on your mind and it's based on your name and it's based on, uh, on your, your mind, your ideas, all the, the personification of you. We, we, all the things that you do, every time you use the word, I, me, my, mine, you're imputing this identity upon your world, upon yourself. But it is conceptual. It's an idea. We can't point to a physical part of the body that this exists. It, there's not an organ next to your spleen that's called self. Um, and it's imputed upon collections labeled mind, collections labeled body, and collections labeled experiences. Imputed means to put upon something, right? to superimpose. Uh, so we conceptually put this idea that we have of me upon these collections, the collections uh, labeled mind. The mind itself is a collection of things, right? We have a collection of memories, we have a collection of intentions, collections of emotions, there's, there's biochemical collections within the mind uh, and or brain. And then we have collections labeled body. Again, the body is a collection of collections, right? The heart is a collection of different parts. We have bones and blood and everything else. And then we have collections labeled experiences, right? Our, you know, our, our world, our life, our identity is based upon all of our prior experiences. One thing that I didn't put in here at one point I'd love to change is I don't make it clear enough that the identity itself, self, is a collection as well, right? As we talked about, self is a collection of collections of mind-body experiences, memories, all kinds of things, right? So, so everything exists in these collections. And then we talk about I'm an ethereal, ethereal and wonder, wondrous entity. Ethereal is a great word that means to take something possibly conceptual and make it more concrete. So uh, ethereal is kind of, I always think of a cloud when I think of ethereal. It's real, but it kind of blows through and uh, it's not so tangible, right? So this idea of self is a concept. It's not something we can physically touch we can physically point to i don't believe we have the technology to take pictures of it or to 
to uh, discover it with machines. It's ethereal, but clearly it's real. There's no doubt about it. We all have an identity. And it's a wondrous entity. And by that, I, I really mean that it's, it functions in such a miraculous way. It's, it's of the mind, it's of the body, it's of experiences, but it isn't. It's built upon those, but somehow it exists in its own way. And I do believe we're all blessed with infinite potential and an unlimited capacity for good. Buddhism believes that goodness, benevolence is our true nature. And uh, then we talk about these collections and identity are not static elements, but instead are dynamic processes. So this is something that Buddhism uh, does. It's for you philosophy uh, uh, lovers out there, this is very Heideggerian. <clears throat> the idea is that life should be seen <clears throat> more from a verb-like perspective, that things aren't, uh, phenomena aren't things, phenomena are processes. All phenomena are in a state of constant change, even something like a giant mountain is slowly diminishing. Um, so, uh, and especially when we look at ourselves, the human being, the human being isn't a static thing. A human being is a dynamic process in every moment different than it was a moment ago. Physically, we know the body is always changing, the cells are rejuvenating, we're getting older. But mentally, emotionally, every day with different experiences, we change. So we are this amazing dynamic process that's in a constant state of change. <clears throat> and existing interdependently in a state of constant and infinite change. Oh, thank you. Uh, and uh, the next line is, is wonderful. Our reality is a subjective interpretation of an objective world. We talked about this in the two truths. We talk about objective meaning object or phenomena outside ourselves and subjective, we're the subject looking out at, at objects. So subjective means an internal experience, <clears throat> but it's based on uh, external experience. My subjective internal view is based upon this objective physical world, right? So both are true. The, now my, my subjective interpretation is conceptual, and but it's still real, there's no doubt about that. And it's built upon the objective world. And the two come together and create conventional reality as we know it the first noble truth, the, the conventional truth, that, that our labels, our ideas about things, those are real, and so are the actual things themselves. Now, it talks about them, them being perceived through limited sense perception. And this is important because we always have to keep in mind that when we're exploring, investigating the world, we have to understand that we're always taking in limited information. We only can take in what the human senses have the ability to take in. The human eye can't see the full spectrum of, of uh, light and color. Uh, our ears, our nose, it's the same thing. Our senses are limited. <clears throat> now, maybe we take in enough. Maybe we have a nice, a nice accurate picture of the world, but nevertheless, we have to keep that in mind. And then it's not just our senses. It's also our mind's ability to process that sense material. Even if our eyes can take something in, you could look at something really, let's say advanced, and just not know what it is or be able to process what it is. Maybe I could look at a, I could look like a, I could look at a blackboard of a physicist with all the scientific writing all over it and um, and and i just don't i don't have the ability to comprehend what it's saying right so a lot of it's also our mind it's not just our senses <clears throat> but what we do take in it's understood through this wonderful collective conceptual construct which is one of the most miraculous things in existence that we have this ability 
to look at the objective world and make sense of it. We can give things labels. We can give things value. We can tell the difference between safety and danger from food, from poison. And, and we can share that information with others through language. And we can also create things, right? We can invent things. All of these things happen through our conceptual construct. It's a remarkable thing. All the wondrous things in the world that human beings have created have been created through the conceptual construct. They didn't exist in the objective world until they were created. So it is truly magnificent, this conceptual construct. And, uh, and again, it says uh, it serves as a beneficial interface with our environment. Um, which is, is so true. This is how we understand the objective world. And then it talks about awakening, liberation. It's contingent upon this understanding of this truth. And it is understanding how we operate, understanding the, the way the world really is, is the path to awakening. So therefore our practice is to, to cultivate this new view and try to embody it and understand it. And then it talks about leading to a direct experiential realization, which is awakening. So right now we're understanding this conceptually, right? I'm talking about it, we, we have some writing on it. This is a conceptual understanding. So this is what we begin with and we get an idea and we practice with it. But at some point, you'll, you may have a direct experience of it, whether in meditation or out. And a direct experience would be, you could be sitting in a chair and all of a sudden, these concepts that we're talking about appear to you directly and you actually see the world exactly the way I just described it. You truly see the difference between the conceptual, constructive concept, subjective reality and objective reality. And you see the beautiful uh, the beautiful union of the two, that they're never in conflict, right? And you see the world like this. This is called a direct experience or direct realization. That is the that is actual awakening, right? So we can we awaken slowly through the conceptual, but there's a difference when we get into that direct experience. Any questions about all of that? I'm hoping this class doesn't go on and on. I got a lot to share. Everybody okay with that? David, please. Sorry. Um, just a quick question then about collective um, conceptual construct. Um, do, do, is there just one for the whole of humanity, or do we all have our own versions of the collective conceptual construct? Uh, there's many. Everyone has their own that's unique, but they're all built upon. Uh, the collective, right? So we all have a conceptual construct in our minds of our world. But from the very first day you entered school and you learned all the names of the animals and you learned math and you learned language, right? You, uh, this is sharing the conceptual construct. So, so socially we have one, culturally we have one. And then there's different ones for different cultures. And they all share a lot in common, right? So we talk about, let's say, Indian culture. They might have a different language or many languages, as we know. They could use mathematics the same way. They could have a basic understanding about animals like we do, but also it's slightly different because it's to their own culture. And even smaller, like even your family kind of has their own conceptual construct, right? And maybe it's wrong for us to say that each one has their own, but let's just say each one is influenced. Each one has a different flavor right? The conceptual construct of your family, you guys might have jokes that nobody else gets. You guys have language maybe that nobody else understands. So the, 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 this con conceptual construct is modified by everybody that uses it. Kind of like the internet, isn't it? Like you can go to se sections of the internet that talk about certain things. Like you can go to TikTok and and young people are using vocabulary that I have no idea, slang that I have no idea what it means. And then you go to a Buddhist site, and I kind of get that. So it's, yeah, it's this beautiful, malleable thing that's in a state of constant change, just like all the things in our, in our world, right? 
Yeah, yes. thank, thank you. you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, I'm moving on, everybody. Buckle up. Here we go. <laughs> so, oh, let's talk about this. So, so we talked about our true nature. And again, why is it so important? You know why it's really important? Because it's the difference of, between samsara and nirvana, right? So a couple Buddhist terms. Samsara is conventional reality. Samsara is the world that we all know, right? And it's a world that's filled with a lot of suffering and unsatisfaction and everything else. Nirvana is an awakened existence, enlightened existence. So Buddhism posits these two ways of existing. But they're not places. They're mental states, right? Samsara is, the, is a mental state that we see the world in this way. We have a conventional, just like the, the first the first of the two truths is conventional truth. It's conventional reality. This is a big part of, of samsara, is this understanding. So, understanding who we are has a lot to do with our perception and our uh, projection of samsara or nirvana. And I didn't explain that very well, but my next slide does everybody so let's talk about how it actually works before we start i got two two terms i want to make sure everybody understands at the bottom of the screen we have this this term reify to make an abstract thing seem real or concrete right this is the idea uh, reify sometimes you could use the word exaggerate but to reify to make something something like an idea to make it a concrete thing. And then we have the, the term ethereal, which we talked about before, which is a subtle, abstract, intangible, or immaterial. A cloud is kind of ethereal. Ideas are ethereal. I'm going to read through this uh, affirmation, and then we'll talk about it. The causes of suffering and liberation affirmation. Through reifying our identity, we reify our vulnerability. Through reifying our vulnerability, we reify our problems. Through reifying our problems, we reify our suffering. Conversely, in the opposite way, through real, realizing the ethereal nature of our identity, we realize the ethereal nature of our vulnerability. Through realizing the ethereal nature of our vulnerability, we realize the ethereal nature of our problems. Through realizing the ethereal nature of our problems, we realize the ethereal nature of our suffering. In a sense, this is the, the cause of samsara and the liberation of nirvana. So when we talk about when we talk about this idea of wrongly perceiving self, most of the time what it is, it's we have an exaggeration of what self is, right? We've been talking about that so far. We've been saying that self isn't this permanent, unchanging, essential essence of who we are, right? Buddhism says that's not what we are. And the reason it's saying that is because most of us think so. Most of us think that there is this aspect of us that's essential, right? And the problem with it, when we exaggerate that sense of self and we make that self more, we reify it, we make it, we exaggerate it and make it more real than it is. Well, unknowingly, we also increase or exaggerate our own vulnerability because the more real we see ourselves, the more vulnerable we are. So we're real. We're not denying that. We're, talking, we're not talking about whether we exist. We're talking about how we exist. So first things first, we accept that we're real. The self is real. But when we exaggerate how real it is, when we reify the self or identity, at the same time, we're exaggerating our sense of vulnerability, right? If the self is ethereal, not much can hurt it, can it? 
But if that if that self is a real thing, then it can very much be hurt. And then through that vulnerability, we then have the same problem. We exaggerate the realness of our problems. And by reifying our problems and making them more real, clearly the same thing happens. We, we reify our sufferings and we make our suffering much more tangible, right? Or so we exaggerate our sufferings. So now this is how we end up in samsara. This is a samsaric mind, right? By exaggerating the realness of our identity, we exaggerate our vulnerability, our problems, and our suffering. Now, conversely, through studying Buddhism and the true nature of ourselves in reality, the two truths, dependent origination and emptiness, we realize the ethereal nature of our identity. And by doing so, we realize the ethereal nature of our vulnerability. And by understanding the ethereal nature of our vulnerability, we realize the ethereal nature of our problems. Now, that's not saying problems don't exist. It's saying that a great deal of the problems that we have are, are exaggerated or even made up, right? Now, I, I take some poetic license in this affirmation, but there are clearly some problems that are not ethereal. When you have a bad toothache, there is nothing to theory about that. That's a toothache. You step, you drop a, you drop a hammer on your toe. That's not a theory. That's real. But a great deal of our problems are mental. We exaggerate things, right? We worry about things that will never come to pass. And then through realizing that ethereal nature of those problems, clearly we simply just don't suffer as much, right? So you can see how by understanding our true nature and the true nature of reality and how things really work, it changes our view, our perspective. It changes the way we, we apprehend the world around us. And in doing so, it frees us from a great amount of our suffering. And especially a lot of mental conceptual misunderstandings that have that are just problematic. They've always been problematic. Any questions? What do you guys think of that? Is that comp you are, yeah, Michael, let's hear it. Why do we reify our problem? Why do we reify our identity? Because we want to exist. We don't want to be ethereal. I want to be, I'm Tenzin Tarpa, I want to exist. I want everybody to know I exist. I'm going to build monuments so when I'm gone, people will still know that I existed. It's a, it's a fear, fear of the unknown and, uh, you know, and just a, yeah, a fear of, of not existing. It's a deep fear we all have. Do you have it, Michael? Do you feel it? I do, yes. <laughs> do you? Uh, I'm starting cool. to. Proven I exist. I do this a lot <laughs> by asking a question on Zoom. <laughs> There's proof for everybody, and it's very subtle. You have to really dig deep to kind of see these things. You maybe certain things like, you know, have you ever been at a party and you're ignored by everybody, and it just it kills us, doesn't it? It's like we need to be acknowledged, right? And well, it may be a simple version, but. Yeah, we have this. We have this uh, this terrible need to be uh, to exist, to be substantial. Yeah, but look at the problems that come along with it. Now, a wise person sees that and says, "Hey, I might want that, but it's bringing me all the things that I don't want." And so, when you see it through different eyes, and you realize, "Oh, that's exactly the thing that's causing all the trouble in my life." then you can start letting go of this need and think about think about this need it's more than just a need to exist it's to exist in a big way 
you know, why do you think people want to be famous, right? <laughs> that, that's an exaggeration of that of that fear, right? They want to be famous. They want the whole world to know who they are. They want the whole world to love them. People that are overly greedy in a lot of ways, it's really them trying to satisfy this need for them to be, to be real, substantial, right? To be the richest, to be the best, to stand out over everyone else. So it's really ingrained in us. We want to be loved by everybody. We want to, we all want to be the most liked guy at the party. Dana? All right. So how, hmm. um, how do I give up my habit of uh, reifying myself and, uh, and, and give up the, uh, the fear of, uh, not existing. How do I, how do I, I change that? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, of course I know. I'm saving that for the end. That's what this is all about. Give me a second to get to that. Okay, let's move on. So, and, and both of those slides are going to be available to everybody. So, perfect timing, Dana, on my notes. That's exactly the next question. What do we do with this information? And uh, so, so, first of all, by understanding, we start to slowly come out from under it. You started it already when you came to these classes. You know, when, when, when you listen to me talk about the problems with reifying ourselves, or let's say the problems with misunderstanding who and what you are, misunderstanding life, misunderstanding what reality is, and all the trouble that comes from that. Boy, no, you can't argue with that, can you? Misunderstanding yourself and your life, of course you're going to have trouble. And then, of course, the opposite of really understanding who and what you are, understanding how life works, how reality works, understanding other people's needs. You know, this leads to us living the kind of lives we want to live, right? I mean, it could be anything. You could be playing a board game. If you don't know the rules of the board game, if like, let's say Dana, you and me are playing chess, well, you you only ever played checkers, right? <laughs> you're not gonna have a pretty, you're not gonna have a good chance of beating me because I've played ch chess before. Not not that I'm good, but I've played. But you take the time to read a couple books, and you're doing pretty good on the chessboard. And then you go even further; you become an expert. You read and you play and you put some real effort. And let's imagine that chessboard is life. Man, you're just cleaning up, aren't you? I mean, it's a pretty easy, pretty easy uh, assertion to get behind, right? Life becomes better. Life becomes easier. Life becomes more satisfying when we know how it works and we can work with it, right? So that's the first thing. And you're doing it now. And just like learning to play chess, you're going to want to read more about it. You're going to read some other books about it. You're going to read about these topics we talked about. The two truths, dependent origination, emptiness, karma, impermanence. You know, there's quite a few Buddhist topics, and they, they all point to the same thing, to the nature of reality. And to make things simple, you are the nature of reality yourself. So when you study the nature of reality, all phenomena within reality coincides with the same objectives, with the same assertions. So uh, when you understand yourself, you understand others. You understand the nature of reality and vice versa. Um, but then we can also have some practices. You know, you can get some guidance from a kind monk <laughs> who wants to help you become happier. And um, we have a couple of those. So uh, first of all, just a lot of the practices you're doing right now are, are working. Uh, Dana, I know that you're, uh, you do your morning affirmations, right? So we have, uh, with SBT, we have morning affirmations for our, for our Sangha, our practitioners. And uh, affirmations are kind of like little Buddhist prayers, and they just remind you of stuff. So like, 
we have an affirmation on emptiness. We have an affirmation on this. So uh, two of the uh, two of the slides I showed you were our morning affirmations. Every day I read both of those affirmations with a handful of others. And what happens is I slowly start to change the way I look at the world. You know, every time I read the affirmation of my true nature, a different part kind of jumps out at you and you go, hey, yeah, yeah. And one day you go, oh, I finally get that part, right? Anybody had that experience? And another, another week, it's another one. It's like, oh, yeah, I kind of get it. So the affirmations are one of the greatest ways to, to do it because they slowly program us to see the world differently. And, you know, in Buddhism, it's all about right view, right perspective, right? Right apprehension. Buddhism says that awakening is changing the way you see the world change the world the way you apprehend the world and it changes your reality yeah so the affirmations are a great way to start and then we also have some other practices and one of them is a practice i'd like to share today called abiding on the abiding in emptiness <clears throat> uh and oh yeah let me call it up so uh, again a great deal of what we're doing to get better at these things is just continuously kind of pondering, contemplating, returning to these themes. And every time you do it, every time you go to another teaching, maybe another teacher puts it in a certain way and you get a certain part better than Tarpa taught you, you know? That's kind of what it's about. They're heavy topics. It takes a while, but after years of practice, you really start to change the way you look at the world. And that's what we mean by right view, to gain, a, a, let's say, a, a more skillful perception and apprehension of the world, right? Okay, so uh, we have this great practice. Now, we usually have this, uh, this is usually for advanced practitioners. I'll make the slide available to everyone. Anyone can practice it. And uh, it's built on a practice we call abiding on the breath. Abiding on the breath is when you're out and about, no matter what you're doing, if you're working, if you're walking, if you're eating with your friends, we always try to keep a little bit of awareness on the breath. So no matter what you're doing, just a little bit of your awareness is focused on the inflow and outflow of your breath. And uh, it, it, it has a way of keeping us present, and it's a very powerful practice. This is the next step. So once you're pretty comfortable with that, you can add this. And it's kind of a conceptual uh, piece that we're laying upon that practice. And so I'll read through the affirmation, and then we'll talk about it. Abiding in emptiness affirmation. Today I commit myself to awakening by abiding in emptiness. I do this by anchoring my awareness on my breath while reflecting on the empty nature of reality, that all phenomena are empty of inherent existence or essential essence, and instead exist interdependently, reliant on parts, causes, and conditions. Therefore, my daily practice is to see beyond my conceptual construct of labels, concepts, and interpretations, which my mind superimposes upon reality. To try to discern and embrace the ethereal and wondrous true nature of reality and the magnificent interdependent dance of subjective and objective reality. That yeah, pretty, huh? Can you guys see each one of the topics that we talked about in the four in the four week series, right? They're all here, aren't they? This brings everything together that we learned into one practice. So let's go through it quickly. Today I'm committed to awakening by abiding on empty. And remember, emptiness isn't isn't like an emptiness, like an emptiness of refrigerator or emptiness of stomach. It's more lacking that phenomena lack self-existence. Phenomena lack any essential essence, right? So there were empty of essential essence, but that word emptiness is problematic, huh? It makes us think of voidness, doesn't it? It makes us think of space. It's not. 
it's lacking. All phenomena lack any essential essence that makes it that thing. So, oh, I, I remember. When you think of emptiness, flip it over and instead say dependent, right? So you're not looking at the emptiness of something. You're looking at the dependence of something, right? Because that's what em emptiness says, all things are dependent. So when somebody says, oh, the emptiness of... Uh, of uh, a book, what you're really talking about, you're talking about the dependence of a book, that a book is dependent on all these different parts, but lacks any single essence that makes it what it is. Okay, I do this by anchoring my awareness on the breath. Now, this is something, this practice you do when you're out and about, again, if you're working, if you're walking around, you could do it anytime, while reflecting on the empty nature of reality. Okay, again, while reflecting on the dependent nature of reality. I just came up with that the other day when I was thinking about it. I was thinking about how to explain this, and I thought, oh, let's just flip it. Every time we say empty, let's say dependent. While reflecting on the dependent nature of reality, that all phenomena are dependent are, or are lacking of inherent existing or essential essence, and instead exist dependently, reliant on parts, causes, and conditions. That's all pretty clear. So therefore, the daily practice is to try to see a little bit behind the conceptual construct, which is, again, our labels, concepts, interpretations. Mental baggage, our, our, our conceptual concept is all our mental stuff we put on everything. Now, when we talk about this, <clears throat> um, this isn't a huge thing you do. It's, a, it's uh, seeing this, you know, abiding in emptiness is, is uh, something that uh, practitioners, it's very rare when they have a realization of emptiness. So this is a very, very uh, high thing to do. But you can begin with, with subtle things. And so like when you're looking at a tree, you can kind of step back a little bit and try to comprehend like what aspects are really there and which aspects am I imputing upon it? You know, the name tree doesn't exist in, in the objective world. That's not there. And actually the tree existing as a single object isn't really there, is it? That tree is a collection of all kinds of collections. Each leaf is a collection. Each cell is a collection. Each piece of bark is a collection. And then you try to look beyond your likes and dislikes, things like that, you know? Try to look beyond it, to, that it stands out from its environment because tree doesn't exist separately from its environment. It's a collection within the landscape, isn't it? So you start to do a little mind game like that. You kind of play around with the idea. And again, you try to discern the, the what's ethereal and what's not, right? And, and, and how it exists in this incredible dance of subjective and objective that, oh, I had a great example uh, a couple months ago, I did, I did a class. Uh, you know, they have these, is it Google that has these new glasses out that you put on your face? And you still see reality, but I think they call it augmented reality. So <clears throat> the idea is you, you put them on, you still see the room you're in. But this augmented reality can put labels on everything. So you still see your room, but now everything has a little label. And this augmented reality can tell you all about each one of the objects, right? And you can even manipulate it. And, and you can actually create things that aren't really there, that appear to be there. This is very much how our conceptual construct works. It's like we're putting on a set of glasses, and it puts labels on everything, values, uh, tells us uh, what we think about these things. It tells us the function of these things, all this information. When it was invented, all these kind of things. Our conceptual construct is very much that same way. So imagine just setting those glasses down and trying to see the world as it truly is. 
And you can turn this internally and try to imagine yourself as you truly are. Without these concepts and thoughts about who you think you are, well, who actually are, who are you? How do you really exist, right? Uh, but as you can imagine, it's, it's quite a, a heavy topic, but we're planting the seed today and we're telling you how it works and you might not pick it up right away, for some of the advanced practitioners out here, you're already doing it, and hopefully the teachings that I've given here are bringing some clarity. To others, it's something that you might want to do in the future. Maybe today's the day you start doing it. But as you can tell, there's, it's, there's not some heavy practice. There's no commitment to time. It's just when you're thinking about it, reflect on it, and, uh, and, ex and ex uh, practice it. Questions? Oh, you got to have a million questions about that. What do you think, Dana? You getting it? Yeah, I like it. It um, I've been doing that, but I like your, uh, you know, your affirmation there, and I'll, I'm going to use that. And, uh, I'll share it with everybody. <clears throat> I think it helps to be retired and to have the time. <laughs> well, you could do these things at work. Uh, Another thing that I wanted to make available to everyone on our in our download library we have practice guides for different levels of practice um all of them are open to anyone anyone can read our material everything with spt is transparent in the bodhisattva level guide book practice book um there is uh, th this affirmation is in there but in the middle of the book or in the appendix are some really good pieces on all of these subjects that we've been discussing uh, this week, and especially on emptiness. We have a nice presentation. It's short, but please uh, download those, and you can uh, read more about the subject matter, and you can do the practices uh, if you'd like to do them as well. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments? What do you think of all this crazy stuff? Buddhists have such a weird way of looking at the world. Does it work? Here's a good question. Oh, that's my own questions. Thank you very much. Does it work? It works amazing. Uh, <clears throat> after all my years of practice, I, I just see the world differently. And what happens is the, the intense immediacy and importance and drama that we put upon the world, right? This ex it isn't real. And it's an exaggeration of drama, of, of the drama of life. It's a lot like television that <clears throat> they call, they, they talk about television being dramatizations, right? They'll, they'll take a true story, but then they add a lot of drama to make it more interesting. And everybody overreacts, oh my goodness. And we really think people act like that. I think it's actually very bad for uh, for all of us. So, if somebody's watching too much TV, they'll actually start to emulate that, and they'll they'll think that oh, that's the proper reaction to that situation, instead of realizing oh, real people don't act like that. Real people are a lot more calm, and so uh, when you start to look at the world this way and you start to understand it, that intense immediacy falls away. And life becomes calmer and more peaceful. There's space. There's, there's space for ideas. There's space for thinking. And uh, what arises from that is happiness and satisfaction and contentment. And when you understand how you work, you start to get a pretty good idea how other people work. And somehow all that contention, all that conflict that you usually feel with others starts to disappear and you realize that I don't have that, that need to fight with people anymore. I don't have that need to be right anymore, you know? So all that drama of life starts to fall away. Tashi? It, it, I'm finding that out. I'm finally finding that out in the past probably six to eight months that it's like, I'm not even going to go there, you know, I'm just, and, and things just go, you know, on their way. They're not meant for you and you don't need to react to everything. 
And that's so what true. it that's what it gives me. Um, I'm starting to I'm okay, I can't say I'm starting to get it, but I think I'm starting to get it. And yeah, we start to get it in very, very little ways. It does it's not a big thing. It's just getting it a little bit, you know, getting it one percent gives yeah. you one percent more happiness. Yeah. Two percent, ten percent. Yep. Yep, definitely. And it, it's just very I don't even know how to explain it. You explain it. <laughs> it's not easy, is it? I've been trying through the four weeks. So No, by... because I yeah, I go back and and Okay, so I listen again, and then there's another aha moment. That's you know, right. there's these little aha moments all the way through. Little and I awakenings. Think I'll always have that. I don't. I don't think I'll ever be awake. I think I'll be always awakening. You know, Buddhism says you you will be eventually. I still have the awakenings. I still have okay. the aha moments, and then we have conceptual aha moments, and then we have direct realizations which mm -hmm. are the real aha moments. I've but by, by, by exaggerating our perception of the world and our needs of the world, we exaggerate everything else. Our reactions, which exaggerate other people's reactions. Yeah. Thank you, Tashi. Uh, Rinchen asks, is it possible to, to watch the world without the conceptual construct? No, it is not. I don't believe it's possible to exist without the conceptual construct. Somebody without it would be kind of a zombie. You know, I mean, they could, I mean, the conceptual construct is what communicates, your, your sense organs communicate with your brain. Like, maybe you could see see and see light and things like that but you there's no knowing right the conceptual construct is the knowing that you're looking at something the knowing that you heard something let alone what you heard so the conceptual construct is so basic even <clears throat> i'm guessing even insects and things like that have it because without it <clears throat> you couldn't interact with the world you couldn't respond <clears throat> Even a single cell uh, organism wouldn't know to move away from dark and move towards light or move towards food. The conceptual construct has all of that, right? Yeah, so it's essential. What do you say we wind things up? I got one last thing I want to share with everybody. And I, I'm hoping that I was, I was clear and, and lucid about some of these things. That's the, the last class. Tying it all together is always the most challenging, all of them. Hey, I got one last slide I want to share with you guys, and I'm going to make it available to everybody so you can embroider it on your pillows around the house. And it is this, that you and your life are like a story that we're continuously writing in every moment. Every person has a story, and this is your story, your life. How will you write it? Mic drop. <laughs> oh, I'm so silly. What a silly monk I am. So I hope everybody enjoyed the... Uh, the, the series. I hope it brought some clarity to everyone, and I hope it makes a lot of people scratch their heads. If you feel overwhelmed by it, don't. These are, these are the deepest topics in Buddhism, right? Uh, we offered this uh, short teaching series because a lot of our Sangha are, are at this level of practice, and, and I was asked to uh, talk about some of them. But if it seems like a lot, just kind of settle into it. We, we do a thing that's called spiral learning. And the idea is that we, you keep coming back to the same subjects, but every time you do it, you get a deeper and deeper understanding. And then at some point you feel like you kind of really have uh, the idea of what it is. So um, uh, it's a slow process and we just, we take it in and the next time it's, it's offered, we listen again, or you listen to the recordings and you understand it at a little deeper level. And as we were saying, <clears throat> it's not like a light switch, you know, whether we're, 
we're unenlightened and all of a sudden a light switch goes on and we're enlightened beings. That's not how it works. It's incremental. The Buddhist path is incremental. We, we awaken through little awakenings. And, you know, every now and then you have this aha moment, you know, once a week you have your nice little epiphany and you think, oh, I finally got that thing that Tarpa was talking about the other day. We slowly kind of get better. But if you can, <clears throat> if you can understand some of this, you know, 5% more or 10% more, then you'll receive that much more happiness. You know, where the Tibetans always made it sound like that we had to work really hard and then in some lifetime far away, I will finally be happy. And that that's just not how it works. As we progress, we gain happiness, right? I'm not a Buddha. I'm not an enlightened being, but I'm a whole lot happier than I used to be. So that's how it works. And we just slowly move towards that. We move that way in a community. And we're all here to benefit each other. And you got like-minded friends that you can talk about. I'm here. I'm a click away for anybody that has any questions. Uh, please join us in our daily meditations. And, uh, and we all awaken together, right? Okay, with that said, I've been talking too much. With that said, let's uh, end today's class with our altruistic affirmation. May all be healthy. Now, listen to this because I, as you get a deeper understanding, these affirmations start to make more and more sense. Listen to the words here. May all be healthy. May all be prosperous. May all be well. May all be present, free of past regret and future worry. May all abide in constant appreciation, which is a source of great joy and contentment. May all realize their true nature and the true nature of reality, which is awakening. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Remember that the SBT community exists for one purpose and one purpose only, to support you, the practitioner. Thanks for coming, friends. Bye-bye.